15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you so much for joining us on this, the 190th edition of the Space Nuts podcast. My name's Andrew Dunkley, your host, and with me, as always, the long-suffering professor, Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. (laughs) Yeah, I do. I suffer all the time. (laughs) Once a week, at least. (laughs) Once a week, that's right. No, I'm fine, thank you. Um, And suffering's not something that I do that much of, although (laughs) you never know, it might be down the track. (laughs) Mm, Oh, well, let's not go there. No. As as the famous Fred Watson always says, I'm not going there. (laughs) I'm not going there, that's right. I think I'm the person who forces you to say that more often than most. Yes, you are. Yes, that's right. Mm. I, uh, yeah. Uh, and, but that's all right. Uh, you, one has to use these expressions sometime, and I'm delighted to be able to use it on Space Nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. OK, today we've got uh, quite a few things to talk about. The New Horizons uh, probe has uh, sent back some data, or they've analysed some data from it, uh, which has basically written off one planet formation theory, which is interesting. It's good that we can write something off, I think, that because it whittles down possibilities. Uh, we're also going to talk about uh, something exciting that made the news this week in Australia, and that was the official opening of the Australian Space Agency. Woohoo! And both yep. people have got a desk each, which is amazing. I didn't, I didn't think the budget had stretched that far. Eat your heart out, NASA. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Also um, of a similar ilk, Virgin Galactic has moved operations um, into uh, their spaceport, in fact, at New Mexico. Uh, Fred's been there. He'll probably mention that. And we've got questions uh, from Mark Mobbs about the size of the universe. Mark, it's this big. (laughs) There, that's answered. And uh, Bob Brown, not the politician from Australia, I'm I'm guessing. Um, What or where is space? That is a rather fascinating question when you really nut it out. And plenty more. We'll do a bit of spruiking about this, that and the other as well. Uh, But first, Fred, let's talk about New Horizons, the data that they have analysed suggesting that uh, one planet formation theory um, is uh, is a write-off. We we don't have to think about that anymore. Plasticine has never been used to make planets. (laughs) No, that's right. Well, um you know, I thought it was super glue, but that, you know, plasticine's as good a bonding as any. Yeah, so it, this goes back to an old favourite of ours. We haven't spoken about this um, celestial object for some time, but last year we certainly did uh, because of the flyby of what was then called Ultima Thule mm. uh, at the beginning of last year on the on the first of January, um, and we saw an image of something that looked like a snowman. Uh, This is, of course, an object six billion kilometres from the sun. It's in the Kuiper belts, that that region of space beyond the orbit of Neptune. Uh, And it looked like a snowman, but uh, some of the later images that were returned from New Horizons showed that it actually wasn't snowman shaped. It was two pancakes side by side, Uh, basically two flattened disks, one slightly bigger than the other, um, and, and joined together just as though they've been placed side by side and stuck together where they contact. With super glue. Uh, yeah, with super glue, that's right. The whole thing, rather than plasticine, the whole thing is 36 kilometres long. And the reason why everybody wanted to look at this uh, and, you know, New Horizons was guided to this following its encounter with Pluto back in 2015, uh, the reason is that this represents, you know, one of the... The, the 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 building blocks of the solar system. It's part of the the debris left behind uh, during the p- process of planet formation. It's probably made mostly of ice, very strong ice icy component. Uh, it will have dust in it as well, though. Um, and the the uh, an analysis that has now been revealed uh, and you know basically released in scientific uh, papers uh, comes about. It, it's uh, more than a year after the flyby, and that's partly because these things take time uh, to to analyse, but also, of course, because New Horizons is so far away, the bandwidth that we receive from it is really slow. It's dial-up mode um, bandwidth, uh, very slow data rates, Uh, and so it's taking... Like Australia's NBN. (laughs) 
<laughs> something like that. That's right. A little bit better, actually. Uh, so the, uh, the, the, the data have taken uh, a, a considerable length of time to, to get back to Earth, probably most of last year. But uh, an analysis has now been done by a number of different groups who have looked at the, uh, the structure uh, of Ultima Thule. I should have mentioned that it now has a proper name. It's called Arakoth. Um, Ultima Thule was always a, a temporary name. It, it just meant the furthest object that you could think of. Arakoth is its new name, um, which comes from the, um, I think it's the creation mythology of, I can't remember where, I think it's a North American, uh, a North American uh, indigenous creation mythology. If I remember rightly, I might have got that wrong. Never mind, that, that's all right. It's, uh, it's an object of great interest. And now uh, we believe it has done exactly what you said at the beginning, which is knocked on the head one of the two principal theories of planet formation, mm -hmm. uh, which leaves the other one, uh, and it seems to fit the bill perfectly for the other one. So what are these two theories? Uh, well, when, when planets are formed, they basically form out of the disk of dust and gas, which swirls around an infant star. Uh, so our sun, uh, 4.6 billion years ago, was an infant star uh, with this pl what's called a protoplanetary disk around it. And the, 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 the basic theories have been similar in some ways, but uh, the, the difference between them is really with the, in terms of the, the violence with, within which the building blocks interact. So the earlier theory, which actually has a posh name, it's hierarchical accretion. Uh, and hierarchical accretion kind of tells you what it's about. It's a hierarchical process. You, you build things up and they crash, and then you build more things up and they crash. Uh, so um, they all start off, of course, with, with, with fl dust particles sticking together, a bit like the fluff underneath your bed. Uh, and, or in your belly button. Uh, well, that's right. Actually, they're not quite as... Um, the, the, the belly button fluff is a little bit more dense than, than the, the underbed fluff. Uh, and that's partly because there are different physical processes at play, in play. Uh, what sticks these particles together in the, you know, in the very earliest stages of planet building is electrostatic forces. They kind of come together and, and jo join up electrostatically. But eventually, the dominant uh, force is gravity. And so this, uh, this theory... Basically, the, the, the um, hierarchical accretion theory says that particles stick together, they get ever larger, they collide, they stick together more, and eventually you get these things called planetesimals, which are more or less the size of Ultima Thule or Arakoth, uh, several tens of kilometres across. Those things, the, the old theory says, OK, you, you get these things, uh, and, and then... The planetesimals themselves collide and collide quite violently and actually sort of blast themselves to pieces and then all the pieces restick together again. Mm. Uh, and that uh, is the theory that really is not supported by Arakoth because the alternative <clears throat> is that you've got streams of what you might call pebble-sized particles. So the dust, the dust uh, grains stick together and grow to things the size of a pebble. But these are all sort of moving together in streams in orbit around the, the infant star. And um, basically, the, the, cloud, you know, the clouds that are moving within these streams uh, essentially just collapse themselves under their own gravity. Um, they don't, basically, they don't sort of uh, go through a phase where they're growing and then they all smash together. They just simply grow. Yeah. So you've got this, this planetesimal, which is made of pebbles that have all been in the same part of the dust cloud around the sun, as it is in our case. And that's uh, essentially uh, supported by Arakoth because, first of all, uh, the, 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 the main point about this theory is that the interactions between the particles that are making up the planetesimals are very gentle. They're not violent collisions. They're gentle interactions, and that uh, is supported so more, more like by... like putting together Lego rather than smashing mud into itself. 
Ex that's right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So you're sticking Lego together. It's a good analogy, except that there aren't spotty lumps on the side of <laughs> all these bits and holes that you can stick them into. Um, but the reason why Aricos supports that view is that is its structure. You've got this, these two pancake shaped objects side by side, uh, which have come together. Uh, at a very, very gentle rate. They, they, they're described by some of the authors as they, they basically kiss together. It's so, so such a delicate um, uh, interaction. Uh, one of the scientists who's worked on this work uh, says that if there were spacecraft, there would be docking. Mm. There is no indication that the merger was violent or catastrophic. So you've got this sticking together. There's another uh, point about this as well that that again um, suggests a great degree of stability in the early solar system, and that's the fact that they are these two pancakes are en edge to edge, so they're both lying in the same plane essentially. It's as though they were flat on a table. Uh, that would not have happened accidentally, but if they'd been in orbit around one another one another for a very long time, then you would get this uh, alignment of their of their principal planes. They, they, they would align in the way that they have. So once again, it speaks of things happening in a very, very stable way. And finally, um, another paper, it's actually a different set of research, but it points out that uh, the imagery we now have back from New Horizons of this object uh, show it is incredibly uniform in colour and composition. It's not uh, you know, it's not an object with great variations in its in its colour, in its shading, and things of that sort. And so, what they're saying is, once again, that points to a, a uniformity of the objects that made it up, the pebbles that basically went into producing this um, this really remarkable looking celestial object. Uh, uh, all the scientists involved with it are very excited. No, none less than Alan Stern, who. Uh, you will remember, is the principal scientist, principal investigator for the New Horizons mission. He was in Australia, I think, a year or two ago. Yep. Uh, we, we got to chat with him. Great guy, full of enthusiasm and um, very, very interesting to speak to. Uh, but he um, he has said, uh, well, in, in throwing away the hierarchical accretion model, this one with all the collisions, he says, we as a team cannot imagine how hierarchical accretion could have created the Arakoth that we see. He says so that kind of knocks that on the head. But he also says um, uh, that they're looking for a new target beyond Arakos for New Horizons to visit. He says we've got fuel left in the tank, the spacecraft is healthy, and we have power to run 15 years. Our greatest ambition is to find another object that we can fly by, and that will be fantastic if they can do that. The problem is these Kuiper Belt objects, these objects deep in the solar system, are really relatively small now. Arakoth is 37 kilometres long, but it's 6 billion kilometres away. Yeah. So it is not an easy task to find it. It was found by the Hubble Space Telescope, if I remember rightly. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're going to be searching for other possible target objects out there in the depths of the solar system, and it will be difficult because they're so faint, so small. Well, is, but, is it possible, I don't know if the timing will work, but is it possible that the James Webb Telescope yeah. might be able to find something? I think that's uh, that's kind of where I was going. Yes, that's right. It's it's the yeah. So you're right on the money there, Andrew. <laughs> Just for once. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not saying I'm not going to go there because that's exactly where I was going. There you are. It, it um, yeah, and and in fact, uh, you know, as we refine some of the technology on uh, on the ground-based telescopes, um, that will help. I think the James Webb will be the one that will be used, though, to 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 look for the the next target of opportunity for New Horizons. As Alan Stern says, they've got power for another fifteen years, so you've got a little bit of time mm. um, in, in which to uh, to search for something suitable and identify it and work out whether you can change the course of the ob of the spacecraft to to, to pass it. So. Um, the James Webb Telescope hopefully launched next year, I think. Um, take a little while to get it in train, but this might be one of its first missions to scan the outer depths of the solar system. Which means anything. the people working on New Horizons are going to get really good at dominoes waiting for that thing to come. <laughs> or Lego, perhaps. Or Lego. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you have to be a kid to be good at Lego.
Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, that's fascinating news. So we can we can write off um, that that uh, hierarchical accretion theory. Um, it's in the dustbin, or as we speak. <laughs> yes, because of <laughs> dust. probably come probably come out again. You know, it'll be something else that oh, turns. Yeah, well, yeah, they'll find another <laughs> rock and go. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, you're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here with the uh, Professor Fred Watson. Let's take a break from the show and hear a word or two from our sponsor, Grammarly. Now, I have to say I'm a big fan of Grammarly uh, because I've been using it for a few years now. Very helpful for authors, but uh, also really good for everyday life. They've saved me on a few occasions, uh, particularly with spelling, but also with a few issues that uh, didn't quite make sense. Uh, it's built by linguists and language lovers, and uh, Grammarly's writing app finds and corrects hundreds of complex writing errors, so you don't have to do it yourself. Word by word, day by day. <laughs> you can uh, easily copy and paste any English text into Grammarly's online text editor or just install uh, Grammarly's free browser extension for Chrome, Safari, Firefox and quite a few others. Grammarly's algorithms flag potential issues in the text and suggest context-specific corrections for grammar, spelling and vocabulary. Uh, Grammarly explains the reasoning behind each correction so you can make an informed decision about whether and how to correct an issue. Grammarly helps you write mistake-free Gmail, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn and nearly anything else you write on the web. Uh, for you, the listener of Space Nuts, Grammarly is offering a free download of the Grammarly software. So if you'd like to download Grammarly today, go to getgrammarly.com slash space nuts. Again, that's getgrammarly.com slash space nuts to download Grammarly for free and let them know you came from us. Uh, I'll include the link in the show notes as well. And now... Back to Space Nuts. Zero G and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Now, I'd uh, like to uh, shout out to our patrons uh, who have joined us on patreon.com slash space nuts uh, for supporting the podcast. Uh, had a few newbies join us uh, in the last week or so. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for supporting our podcast uh, financially. Uh, and it's not expensive. You can um, sign up for as little as $3 a month, US that is. So in Australian dollars, that's about 5 million three hundred seventy thousand no it's not quite that much but um, if you would like to be a patron you'll get a uh, commercial free edition of the podcast you'll get it early and you'll get b bonus material uh, all at patreon.com slash space nuts now fred um we are going to talk about a couple of uh, things involving space agencies one is the australian space agency and then we'll get on to virgin galactic uh, because they've all taken up residence uh, the australian space agency has been officially opened. Indeed it has. Uh, so the, the space agency itself has been operating now for two years, I think, thereabouts, maybe two and a half. Um, in, but it's been based in Canberra in temporary accommodation. In fact, it's been in the building that I work in when I'm uh, down in Canberra. The uh, Industry House, which is the home of the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources. And uh, th that was always a temporary uh, you know, a temporary accommodation. And a, a year or so ago, there was a, you know, an invitation for, for um, uh, letters of interest uh, about where the space agency should find its, its proper home. And a number of different uh, states and cities vied for that honour. And in fact, the outcome was that it uh, basically has gone to Adelaide, which is the capital city of South Australia, one of the states of our great nation. Yes, so, located in the bowels of the continent. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no. I've actually never been to Adelaide. so I, I Really? Have you never been to Adelaide? I've never been to Adelaide. You missed a tree. It's a lovely city, I, Andrew. I've seen it's it good. on TV. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, it's a lovely city. Usually, I've seen when, they're, when they're panning the cameras from the ta light towers at the cricket, that's that's all. Okay, I, that's right, all I've yeah. ever seen of Adelaide. No, there's a lot go a lot goes on in Adelaide. It's um, very uh, yeah, it's well worth a visit. Mm -hmm. The city of churches, it was always called, yes. uh, but it's, it's also uh, you know it, it uh, for, certainly now for anybody who's a space fan, it's got <laughs> it's got big attractions. Yeah. Um, so uh, that you know Adelaide got that 
uh, got that honour of hosting the Australian Space Agency, partly because of a long history of South Australia uh, being associated with space. Uh, I mean, I remember when I was a kid growing up back in the 1850s, well, maybe the, maybe the 1950s, uh, if you talked about space, uh, even in the UK where I grew up, Woomera was the name that came to mind. Woomera was uh, a part of South Australia where tests were carried out to launch rockets. Uh, and a lot of British rockets, when the Brits used to build rockets, uh, they were actually tested there at mm. Woomera in South Australia. And, so and that... for those who want to know, Woomera is an Aboriginal word uh, meaning um, basically a spear thrower. They, they used to have a device <laughs> they could rest the spear on and, and it gave them much more leverage and range and power to throw a spear uh, yeah. using the Woomera. And therefore that's why we called the rocket range Woomera Rocket Range. Yeah, and it and so you know there's still I think there are still artifacts from that era there. But the uh, the association with with space I think um, uh, still continues. There are organisations within Adelaide already um, which which have a, a space focus, and several space industries are based there. So it was a natural I guess it was a natural choice that the space agency should go to Adelaide. What has now happened? is that uh, it, uh, their new building has formally been opened. It's at a place with the slightly uninspiring address of Lot 14. Uh, Lot 14, I think, is a, I think it was a hospital uh, at one stage, which has now been refurbished for a number of, you know, a number of different uh, uh, organisations to have their headquarters there. Lot 14 could become as famous as Area 51, Fred. Oh, it could, yeah. Maybe for different reasons. Well, maybe <laughs> the same reason. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, you don't know. So, uh, yeah, so yesterday, our time as we record this on the 20th of February, yesterday was the day that the Prime Minister went to Adelaide and uh, with the Minister for Science, Karen Andrews, uh, cut the ribbon to open up the uh, the new Australian Space Agency's building. Uh, it's the, the remit of our space agency uh, has uh, always been the same pretty well ever since it was founded, which is to support Australian uh, ventures in space. And by that, it principally means, you know, industrial and uh, technical know-how, uh, the, the small companies that can provide services or uh, or, or actually um, make bits and pieces for rockets. That is what it's all about. It's about nurturing these companies. It's about providing an umbrella organisation so you don't get little startups all over the country doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, and it, it, it so it's very much got an industry focus. So uh, mu most of its budget, in fact, goes in things like supplying grants and uh, making. Um, uh, essentially make, making inroads into providing companies with the backup that they need. There's a, there's a new initiative actually just been, uh, been uh, launched, which is all about uh, inviting, um, you know, startup companies and uh, organizations like that, companies with good ideas to apply for funding to the, to the um, Australian Space Agency. So that's its focus. Its focus is in nurturing Australian industry. At the moment, uh, so the, the world's space budget at the moment, and this is the commercial space budget, is round about $400 billion. Uh, we in Australia have about 1% of that. I think it's about 3.6 or something billion. This is Australian dollars. Uh, but the, in fact, actually, I beg your pardon, it's 3.9 billion. That's the current space industry uh, here in Australia. Uh, the government wants to see that grow to within to something like 12 billion within the next decade. So that's a tripling of what we do uh, and a tripling of, of the jobs as well. There's about 10,000 people employed in the space industry here in Australia. They want that to go up to 30,000 by 2030. That's amazing. I knew, I knew there was a big number in terms of future jobs, but that's incredible. Yeah. Um, the space agency itself, I have to say, is pretty lean. It has a staff of 20. Uh, I wasn't you know, far off then, was I? No, you weren't. It's not like NASA. It's, and they, they still only have two desks. <laughs> they, sh they share the desks. So uh, it's very much an organisation that f facilitates things. That's certainly the way it has been seen and the way it's been set up. Uh, I know 
many of the people in the Australian Space Agency, and they are absolutely dedicated to this. They're, they're very switched on. Um, there are not many things that you can talk about in the space world where they say, oh, I haven't heard of that. <laughs> they've heard of most of it. So they've got, you know, they've got their finger on, on the pulse there across they are across uh, much of the industry. Eventually, there will be space launches from uh, Australia as well, probably down in the south, in South Australia, but also um, Australian Equatorial Launch uh, is a company that wants to launch uh, from Cape York, which is right up in the north. And of course, that's not too far from the equator, which gives you an advantage when you're launching spacecraft into into a, a standard orbit. Yeah, yeah. And uh, look, I, I, I know they um, they listen to us. They share our podcast on their Twitter feed, uh, which we really appreciate. So I hope they understand my jibes are tongue in cheek. <laughs> Some, sometimes. <laughs> uh, but no, no, it's, it's a great, bit rough. It's, news. it's a, it's a bit rough when you've got to explain that. <laughs> They're tongue in cheek. Don't worry. It's well, all right. Some people don't get the Australian sense of humour, but I'm hoping Australians do. Well, so. <laughs> Some of them, yes, again, we're talking about my sense of humour. I was telling yeah, my wife a joke right. last night, and after I finished telling the joke, because I, I used it on air, I then had to explain to her why it, why it was so funny. And she went, oh. <laughs> I would have had more luck explaining it to a cat. Where's Mandu, right. by the way? Yes, yeah, well, he gets all the jokes. Yes, of course he does. He's, Consumed now, with mirth most of the time. Uh, with the, the great news that the Australian Space Agency has been officially opened, we also hear uh, some news about uh, Virgin Galactic because they've moved house. They, They're, too, have um, taken up residence at their official New Mexico spaceport. That's right. So um, what they've done is moved the, the hardware, basically the principal hardware, which is the mothership and the, uh, the space plane, VSS Unity, uh, which is what will be used to fly uh, fair-paying passengers to the edge of space. And that brings us a step nearer to uh, to that commercial service. So it's been in the Mojave Desert where these uh, uh, vehicles have been built and tested so far. All the space plane tests which we've talked about have been uh, over the Mojave Desert. But now moving it to New Mexico, uh, to the... Uh, um, basically the Virgin Galactic Space Terminal at Spaceport America, which is not very far from a place called Truth or Consequences. Great name for a village. Yeah, it is. Um, it, it, so uh, that move really signals the start of the final proving tests for the, the space plane and its, uh, and its mothership. Uh, in fact, the journey itself, it's a three-hour trip, I think, uh, at high altitude from Mojave to, uh, to the Spaceport America in New Mexico. And so that, that journey itself was part of the evaluation process because it's a three-hour trip which is much longer uh, uh, than the space plane is, uh, and, the, and the aircraft are normally, uh, are normally operational. So, you know, it gives, it gives you a, a new, a new um, mode for environmental evaluation. Um, so what they're going to do when they get to Spaceport America is uh, do all, lots of uh, final checks. Probably we'll see more test flights, but we'll also see uh, the... Perhaps uh, what, what you might call the refinement of the of the visitors' experience, uh, you know, how, how it will all come together with people going through the spaceport, which itself is a magnificent building. I've been there, as you as you know. Mm. Um, and but uh, you know how how you feed visitors through that process, how you train them for their. Uh, experience of space and how you give them the very best experience when they're actually on the on the trip. So we'll see lots of uh, lots of future activity. Um, the I think it's the press release that came says the relocation of VSS Unity to Spaceport America enables the company to engage in the final stages of its final of its flight test program. It'll begin with a number of initial captive carry and glide flights from the new operating base in New Mexico, allowing the spaceflight operations team to familiarise themselves with the airspace and ground control. Uh, today, we realised that the next step in that dream by bringing our beautiful spaceship to New Mexico 
We still have significant work ahead, but we're grateful to all our teammates who've made this day a reality. That's George Whitesides, who's the, I think he's the um, CEO of Virgin Galactic. Yes, he is. So uh, it will be interesting to see what happens next. And I think this uh, sort of marks a new phase for Virgin Galactic. Hopefully we'll see fair playing, fair playing flights before too long. Yes, they've, they've had to delay it. They've had um, uh, a couple of issues historically. And, and you, know, you don't want to rush these things. You want safety to be number one. And that's um, slowed them down a bit. But uh, no official date yet, but it can't be too far away. That's right. Just one footnote to this, Andrew, is that there are two more space planes which are currently on the stocks uh, which are being built ah. so um yeah one of uh one of them has uh, the second one's already is uh, i think we saw pictures of it earlier in the year it's already uh in one piece so all its components have been put together and there's a a milestone that um that you you uh, celebrate when you're building something like that it's called the weight on wheels milestone so it means you put you know, everything's put together and it stands on its own wheels, which is great. Yes, indeed. Very exciting news. And we'll look forward to their uh, their first flight in the not too distant future. This is Space Nuts, episode 190 with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Space Nuts. Now, Fred, our uh, YouTube numbers have absolutely skyrocketed. They've gone virgin galactic on us. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. We've gone from a thousand and four to a thousand and six. Well, come on, Andrew. Unbelievable. Gosh. Unbelievable. Uh, staggering. Yeah. But <laughs> if you would like to um, follow us on YouTube, and actually a few people have messaged me to say, oh, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do that, uh, that's great because, um, I don't know, something about the numbers. Hugh, Hugh, our producer, understands all this stuff. I, I leave it all to him. But, um, yeah, the more numbers, the um the more interesting we are to YouTube or something to that effect. It might have something to do with advertising. Um, I'm not sure. But uh, if you would like to follow us on YouTube, just uh, go to YouTube and do a search for Space Nuts Podcast and you'll find us and you can subscribe and you can hear everything there as well as all the other podcast platforms that exist in the world. I think we're on just about all of them, Fred. That's is, good to know. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> it's, uh, it's exciting. Um they mustn't have much material. Anyway, uh, let's get into some questions, shall we? We uh, will firstly uh, go to a question from Mark Mobbs. Hi, Mark. Thanks for your question. Uh, he says, I've been trying to get my head around the size of the Milky Way and the visible universe and what astronomers can see or understand at different distances out into space. Are you able to put it into perspective for me? For example, I read somewhere that if you shrunk the Milky Way down to the size of a grain of sand, the visible universe would be, in relative terms, about the size of a football oval. I'm not sure if this is correct, but it got me thinking about the observations we make from Earth. Uh, what would be a tiny dot in the middle of a grain of sand? Uh, for example, how he's, he's been very elaborate with his descriptions here. For example, how far out are we looking when we look at the stars in the night sky? Uh, how far out into the universe are we currently searching for exoplanets and how far out can we determine the composition of distant planets? Uh, it goes on to say I'm trying to understand just how much of the universe we really understand in detail or probably more accurate, uh, accurately uh, how much of the universe we really don't know much about in any detail. I assume we have good observations and science from all uh, from within our own galaxy um, uh, i.e. within the grain of sand, but uh, we have progressively less information detail the further out we go into space until we reach a point where we can observe distant galaxies but really don't have the ability to carry out any detailed observations on them. Love the podcast. Cheers, Mark. And that's all we've got time for this week. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that joke, though. Um, look, he's brought up some interesting points, and I'm sure it's... Um, it, it, I, it, I guess the, the further you want to look, you, you, your time scales vary significantly and, and it becomes more and more difficult. I imagine he's right about that. Yeah, that's right. The further you're looking, the, the harder it is. But um, the, there are there's certainly some things we can say about this uh, in terms of you know, trying to understand the scale of things. And that really is um, the, biggest, the big problem in, in astronomy and astrophysics. We have, uh, we have such a huge distance scale uh, that it, it it almost beggars belief. It, it's certainly mind-boggling. Um, Is he right about the football field theory? Yeah, uh, that would be about right. I haven't done the calculation, but it's that kind of thing. A grain of sand, 
you know, the, the horizon of the universe being the football, the edge of the football field and the grain of sand in the middle of it, 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 it sounds, if anything, that sounds like, um, you know, you're making the football field too small. Uh, I'd need to do the calculation on that one. Mm. But, um, just to to, to to get to, you know to get a to get a, um, a, a proper view of it, uh, maybe I'll do that before um, before our next catch up. Well, it's, it's all relative, isn't it? Because some people will be thinking of the Melbourne Cricket Ground, some will be thinking of Candlestick <laughs> Park, some, some will be thinking Wembley Stadium. I mean, yeah, you know, which one? The, they're all different. Which one is it? That, yeah, that's right. No, indeed, that's quite so. Let me, uh, but but there are some things I can say, and so. Uh, Mark's point about uh, how far out are we looking when we look at the stars in the night sky? Is it just the distance of the grain of sand, in other words, our galaxy? Mm. It's not even that. Uh, with the naked eye, the stars we see are within a few, you know, they're within a, uh, certainly within a thousand light years or thereabouts. And that is just our immediate vicinity within our Milky Way galaxy. Um, and, be- and that's partly because. Uh, we're in the disk of the galaxy. The disk of the galaxy is a very dusty place. Uh, you don't really see the, you, you know, you, you don't really see through the dust. You can with certain types of telescopes, infrared telescopes and radio telescopes. We can they reveal all that. But the stars in the night sky are really very very close. Um, the Oh, just let me tidy up just a couple of questions. How far out into the universe, in other words, the universe beyond our Milky Way, are we currently searching for exoplanets? Well, the exoplanet search is specifically uh, for uh, stars within our own galaxy. Uh, I think there might have been one detected in the Andromeda galaxy, which is our nearest big galaxy, but basically you've got to be looking at nearby objects to discover exoplanets, nearby stars. So actually most of them are very local. They're within uh, within a thousand light years or so. How, can, how far out can we determine the composition of distant planets? That's again something that's relatively nearby because to do that, if you're looking at planetary atmospheres, and we'll certainly do more of this with bigger telescopes, you, you're not just um, looking looking to try and see the or see evidence of the of the exoplanet. You're you're also trying to break up its light into a spectrum uh, to see what's in that spectrum, and that means you're diluting the light still further. So. Uh, you really are talking about nearby and relatively bright objects, usually typically within 100 light years. Um, One, uh, I think it's a really good comparison that brings home what these distance scales are like, uh, is if you think about our own galaxy, the Milky Way, we're used to seeing pictures of spiral galaxies. Ours is one of them. Uh, It's something like uh, it, it's being revised as we speak, but it's of the, uh, r- roughly 100,000 light years in diameter. Now, that really doesn't mean very much. Um, the way I tend to draw the comparison is if you imagine a, a, a portrait of the Milky Way, you know, a beautiful spiral of galaxies, you can imagine that as a picture in a book or something like that. Um, and indeed, um, Cosmic Chronicles has got things like that in it. <laughs> Just a plug there, I couldn't resist. Uh, all right, now you take this picture of the galaxy and you blow it up to be the size of the Earth. So you've got a portrait of a galaxy that's 12,500 kilometres in diameter. It's big. It's, it's, you know, that's a very big picture. And then you can ask the question, how how far apart would the Earth and the Sun be on that scale? In other words, the scale of the solar system or the inner solar system. Uh, And the answer is, if the galaxy was scaled to be the size of the Earth, the separation between the Earth and the Sun on that scale is two millimetres. Oh, wow. So, um, you know, that's, what's that, a twelfth of an inch or thereabouts. (laughs) So uh, that's telling you just how much bigger the scale of the galaxy is than the scale of the solar system. And then you know, Mark's comparison that that to compare the scale of our galaxy with the scale of the universe. Yes, you're talking about something similar, a grain of sand to a football field. So it really is, uh, it, it, the distance is really the killer here. And it astonishes me how much we do know uh, when we're talking about these, these big distances. So you're quite right, Mark, you do get less information as you go further out. But um, you know, we're we're looking out when we look out into the the football-sized 
at football oval size space, you're also looking back in time. And we can learn a lot by looking at early galaxies. We, we can see their structure. We can work out what their chemical elements are like, what's, what sort of shape they're in in, in a galaxy like that. Uh, but the details, the further out you go, the, the more blurry the details become. Yeah. Now, you said we look at the night sky and we basically see our own galaxy. We see the stars within. But w we can see other galaxies, can't yeah, we, that, the naked eye? That's correct. We can. Um, so, but g generally speaking, it's the, the neighbouring stars. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, you know, the, when you look at the Milky Way, uh, mostly, most of the stars in the Milky Way are fairly nearby, but there are parts of the Milky Way, certainly in Sagittarius, where you're, you're looking at the bulge of the galaxy. That's the central region where uh, the, in the nucleus of the galaxy it's so, sort of got a bulge shape to it. Those stars are 25,000 light years away. So you're looking there, you know, at something that is, well, we're about halfway from the centre to the edge. So you're looking... Uh, over a distance which is the quarter of the radius of our galaxy. And as you say, there are uh, different galaxies that we can see with the naked eye. There's not many of them. The two Magellanic clouds here in the south, the large and small clouds there, uh, I think the large cloud is about 165,000 light years away, the small cloud uh, 200,000 light years away. And then finally, the, the most people, the most distant object they can see is the Andromeda galaxy, which is about 2 million light years away. That's in the constellation of Andromeda. But they're rarities. You know, when you look at the night sky, most of what you see is very nearby. Yes, indeed. All right. Thanks, Mark. Hope we managed to um, answer most of your questions. Uh, there were many, <laughs> but we appreciate it. Uh, let's move on to a question from Bob Brown. Hi, Andrew and Fred. Love your podcast and the books bought Cosmic Chronicles. And Parallax last yep. year. Good reads. Great stuff. Which one was better, Bob? Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a question. <laughs> uh, this, this is of a similar ilk. What slash where is space? I know the current accepted start of space is 100 kilometres from Earth's surface, but surely real space starts um, at the end of the exosphere at about 10 kilometres. Uh, anything below that level is in the Earth's gravity field and surely where there is no gravity field on uh, of Earth, that has got to be the definition of where space begins. Uh, everything below that is still in orbit and will, uh, over time, fall to the ground and therefore it really cannot be said to be space, surely. Uh, otherwise, why not say space begins at the Earth's surface because Earth's uh, itself is in space, is it not? I understand the current boundary is where um, uh, aeronautics ends. I think that's what he means. Um, yeah. uh, that being when a plane cannot fly because the atmosphere is too thin, that would be the ceiling of the aircraft, I imagine, and that varies. Uh, that being when a plane cannot fly because the atmosphere is too thin, but it is still atmosphere above that point, is it not? I hope you can clear this up for me. I still remember being told at uni that the only people who have really been to space are all the Americans. Uh, they went to the moon, I'm guessing. Uh, although we were talking about this last week, and we discovered that the moon is passing through the Earth's atmosphere. So, yes, that's right. <laughs> you know, it's a yep. it's a it's a difficult one in some ways. Well, respects. It, it it is and it isn't. There's there's a few misconceptions in um, in Bob's uh, question. Um, uh, let me just start at the end. Uh, at the moment, the the total number of people who have been in orbit around the Earth, and that's a pretty good definition of space if you're in orbit. Mm. Uh, is uh, more than 500. So um, that's quite a lot. And a lot of those have been people who've been on the International Space Station. Um, but the, the, the yes, so, so Bob's initial, you know, what he's saying at the beginning is correct. Um, the normal definition of where space starts is something called the Kármán limit is 100 kilometres above the surface. And that is, is all about aeronautics. That's right. It's where the atmosphere is simply too thin uh, for any kind of aviation type, you know, um, controls to be of any use. You no know, good moving your ailerons up and down or your elevators or whatever, because nothing will happen. Yeah. Um, 10 kilometres is an interesting level that he describes as well. Um, 10 kilometres is actually, it's not really the start of uh, space, but it's where most, uh, where most jet aircraft fly. Yes. And at that height, 
you are almost in space. You're above 75 percent of the atmosphere. Um, and so above that are the, the, the outer layers of the Earth's atmosphere. It's, uh, I often think when I'm sitting on a plane, I seem to do that quite a lot. You're effectively, you're almost effectively in space. There's still atmosphere above you, but, uh, and you, and of course, you're supported not by orbital considerations, but by the fact that you're, uh, you're airborne, you're, you, that the air is carrying you. But it is still extraordinary technology that lets us do that. So the the, the big misconception I think that that Bob's um, uh, uh, email suggests is the effect of gravity. Now the Earth's gravity field goes to infinity. Uh, it's not something that stops in space. We, we, we talk about zero gravity in space, but it is a misnomer mm. uh, because the gravity is still there. Um, uh, the, 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 when you've got people in orbit, uh, uh, you know, at, at a height, say, well, the International Space Station, roughly 400 kilometres above the Earth's surface, it's in orbit around the Earth. The gravity that they're feeling is is very similar to what we feel on the Earth's surface. It's not really very much different. But the reason why they're weightless is because they're falling towards the Earth all the time. Oh, and what, so you get that, that effect of... of yeah. You're just falling, yeah. So you float because yeah, that's, of the falling that's right. effect. What, what stops you hitting the Earth is this forward motion of 8 kilometres per second or so, yeah. which means that as you fall towards the Earth... Uh, the Earth is receding away from you. So, at the same. Always, so you maintain altitude. You, you maintain exactly the same altitude. That's mm -hmm. right, and that just, that'll just keep on going. But the gravitational pull is is the same, effectively the same as the surface. It does drop away once you get to the Moon. It's fallen away significantly. In fact, uh, you know, you, the, there's a point between the Earth and the Moon where the Moon's gravity becomes dominant. But uh, if the Moon wasn't there, you'd still be feeling the pull of the Earth's gravity. It will be much, much lower by, by that stage, at that distance. But, um, but it, it, it does, gravity is a force that goes on effectively to infinity, although in, in real terms, you know, it diminishes um, so that when you, the, the further away you are from something, the less you feel of it. Mm. Uh, I, I should point out, though, that when, you, um, you know, when you're navigating a spacecraft like New Horizons through the solar system, uh, you, when, you, when you're calculating its trajectory, you've got to take into account not just the gravitational pull of the sun, the biggest object in the solar system, but all the planets as well. Jupiter, Saturn, in order of mass, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and then going down through the Earth and Mars, all those planets make their contribution because they've all got gravity, even at the distance of New Horizons. So you have to take them into account. So the definition of where space begins, as Bob suggests in his email, is, is a pretty loose and woolly one. And really that Kármán limit is one that has been adopted purely as a matter of convenience. Um, because you can say it's where, uh, you know, uh, in fact, actually below that, uh, you know, well below that, the aeronautics stops uh, and you're really dictated, your movements in space are dictated by orbital mechanics, by uh, the ballistic forces. So, um, uh, uh, so, so I guess uh, the, the one question he's thrown in there is uh, if we're standing on the surface of the Earth, are we in space? Yeah, in, in a sense we are yeah. uh, because the Earth is, is an object that, you know, that exists within space. But from a practical point of view, you wouldn't say that the base of our atmosphere was the same as, uh, as the region uh, 100 kilometres above it where there's virtually no atmosphere yeah, at all. We're not stuck in a vacuum. That's right. Except for the dust that you take from under the bed with, yeah. Whatever. Okay, <laughs> um, all right. And so, yeah. essentially, it, it's uh, it's a it's a bit of a fuzzy one. So, um, yeah, we we de we define these things for convenience sake more so than anything. That that's correct. Yeah, mm. that's right. All right. Bob, thanks for your question. Love your address. Harvey Bay, Queensland, Australia, Earth, Solar System, Milky Way, Local Galaxy Group, Local Galaxy Sheet, Virgo Supercluster, <laughs> Laneka, is that what he's saying? Uh, observable Funny Universe, up. Cosmic Micro background, uh, Microwave Background, The Universe, and then question marks. I will add Multiverse just to keep it interesting, Bob. <laughs>
I used to do you're, that. You're all mad. You're all mad. I'm not crazy. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. why we're space nuts, Fred. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate your question. And that just about wraps us up, uh, except to say uh, don't forget to visit the Space Nuts shop. It's on our website, bytes.com slash space nuts. That's B-I-T-E-S-Z. Uh, log on and have a look around, see if you uh, buy a T-shirt or a book or um, or a T-shirt. <laughs> That's about the range of our products at the moment, but we will build on them. We're talking about mugs and other things going forward. We'll see how we go with that. Um, next week, I, I've got um, I've got a job for the audience. I I want someone to come up with a title for my new book. Yeah. So, so next week, if I remember, I will give you a basic synopsis of the story without giving too much away, and. See if someone can come up with a title because I honestly can't. I'm really struggling with it. And um, I've talked to my brother about it because he's done a wonderful cover for me. Uh, he said, I'll oh, call it this. And I went, no, but that's not what it's about. He said, it doesn't matter. It's a great name. I said, yeah, but that's not what it's about. Uh, so I'm going to challenge the audience to come up with a name uh, or a title for my book. And I, I guess if I like one that, that it, I ultimately decide on, I will give that person a credit on the inside cover. How's that? Ooh, now that's a, that's a, that's a treat for you. <laughs> get your name, Good stuff. Get your name in a book. We'll see how that goes. Anyway, yeah. uh, I, I, it's, it's, I don't usually have trouble, but uh, this one's eluding me. Mm. Anyway, well, you're lucky. You get to choose your own book names. I don't. Oh, don't. yeah. Well, <laughs> it's always the publishers. Yeah. That's why. That's why everywhere else in the world, other than Australia, uh, Cosmic Chronicles is called Exploding Stars and Invisible Planets. <laughs> there you go. I don't have that trouble because I'm the publisher. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Fred. As always, it's great to talk, Andrew, and I look forward to talking again next week. Good fun. I'll catch up with you yes. then. Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, and from me, Andrew Dunkley, thanks again for your support and for listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Hope you enjoyed episode 190, and we'll catch you again next week. Space Nuts. You'll be listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Available at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, or your favourite podcast player. You can also stream on demand at Bytes.com. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.